The North Coast of Egypt, 4th century BC. On a thin rocky strip between the Mediterranean Sea and the marshes of Lake Meriut, Alexander the Great will build his Egyptian Alexandria, just opposite the crescent-shaped island of Pharos. But the brackish lake cannot act as a reservoir of drinking water for the new town, and there are no springs or rivers in the vicinity. From the very earliest times, the Egyptians had built their towns along the banks of the Nile. Of the seven great branches of this river that cut through the delta, the nearest to Alexandria at its foundation was the one that emptied into the sea at Knopos, more than 30 kilometers to the east. How could one be sure of a constant supply of drinking water for this city? that was destined to become one of the greatest metropolises of the Mediterranean world. If there were no natural supply, then man would have to make one. Ptolemy I, founder of the dynasty, ordered his brother, Menelaus, commander-in-chief of the army, to dig a canal that would bring the Nile to the gates of the city. Work was begun once Ptolemy now the new pharaoh decided to make Alexandria his capital. At the point where the canal entered the town, Ptolemy I had a temple built, dedicated to the god Serapis, the Serapeian. During the annual feasts and processions associated with the flood, a sacred golden vase full of Nile water and the cubit the base measure of 52 and a half centimeters, were paraded here in the temple. In the northeast of the enclosure, a nilometer, built as a set of stairs, allowed the drinking water supply for the year to be estimated. The canal, an umbilical cord essential to the very existence of the city, began some 30 kilometers from Alexandria on the canopic branch of the Nile at Skedia. There, too, was a nilometer, demonstrating once again the importance of the flood and, consequently, the size of the harvest. This one was in the form of a pillar, similar to that shown on the Sephorsis mosaic in Israel. Along this canal, foodstuffs and other products were transported from the hinterland. Up until the Mamluk period, Alexandria served as the central hub for the exportation of Egyptian goods to the wider world. Graffiti, discovered on the walls of the Roman necropolis of Anfushi and Alexandria, give a precise picture of the shape of the boats that sailed on the Nile and the Mediterranean. Their sails, called latine, were triangular. C'était le seul voile en usage en Méditerranée pendant au moins quatre siècles. Et elle a encore été utilisée jusqu'au début du XXe siècle. C'est une voile qui a connu une fortune tout à fait extraordinaire que la voile latine. On a voulu y voir, pour certains, avec des raisons un peu idéologiques, une voile d'origine arabe qui aurait été amenée de l'océan Indien en Méditerranée. D'autres dont je suis pense que c'est une voile d'origine grecque et qui, à mon sens, est probablement développée d'abord à Alexandrie. The first section of the canal to Skedia would always follow the same route, while the second grew or shrunk depending on the shifting in the branches of the Nile. The last great works on the canal were undertaken in the 19th century under Muhammad Ali Pasha. They were begun by Shakir Effendi and completed by the French engineer Pascal Coste, assisted by Lenon de Belfont. For the inauguration, 
Muhammad Ali had a mosque built at each end of the canal. Today, only the mihrab remains, a great plaque of white marble engraved with a poem by the Ottoman writer Izzet Mola. Mahmoud Khan made the Nile flow through Ramaneya, and there the land of Egypt received the beneficial effects of divine mercy gathered in the port of Alexandria. The Nile and the sea received their share of the ocean, thanks to the Shah. Thus, from the land of the 4th century BC, the waters of the Nile ran along the canal to the gates of Alexandria. But how was the water distributed throughout the town? In the oases to the south of the country, the Egyptians had long known the Kanat, an underground system of irrigation introduced by the Persians. This was also known to the Greeks. Aristotle mentions it in his Meteorology. At Alexandria, on the advice of a Libyan Greek named Hipponymus, Alexander the Great had channels dug into the bedrock before even laying the foundations to the town. These channels eventually emptied into the sea and were named Hyponymus after their inventor. The basic reason behind the choice of this spot of land by Alexander as the site for his new town seems thus to have been the exceptional nature of the land itself, a band of sandstone that stretched westwards all the way to Libya. But what is so original about the Hyponymus of Alexandria? Recent archaeological excavations have revealed remnants of the ancient water supply network. Nous sommes sur le site du temple de Serapis. C'est un des plus grands sites de la ville d'Alexandrie. Il a été fouillé dans les années 40 par un, un dénommé Alan Rowe, archéologue anglais, qui, à l'occasion de ces fouilles, a mis au jour une partie, une grande partie, du système hydraulique ancien d'Alexandrie, système d'époque gréco-romaine. Ce réseau était composé de divers éléments, dont les puits dont nous avons quelques exemplaires à côté de nous. Traditionnellement, les puits descendent directement dans la nappe phréatique. Or ici, à Alexandrie, les puits descendent dans un autre espace que la nappe phréatique que nous allons découvrir ensemble maintenant. Les puits que nous avons vus en surface descendaient dans ces galeries. Ces galeries étaient disposées de façon linéaire dans le sous-sol. La particularité du système, c'est qu'elles sont disposées juste au-dessus de la nappe phréatique, séparées de la nappe par une couche de sable qui faisait fonction de filtre. Évidemment, la fonction de ces galeries était d'augmenter le rabattement de la nappe, c'est-à-dire la quantité d'eau captée par les drains. La grande qualité de ce système, inventé et mis en place dans Alexandrie par les Grecs, a été donc de fournir une quantité d'eau très importante à Alexandrie et de permettre à la ville de se développer de façon conséquente, puisqu'au 1er siècle avant Jésus-Christ, Alexandrie comprenait environ 500 000 personnes. Alexandria could have continued to function in this way for a long time, despite the ups and downs of history, such as, for example, the destruction by Julius Caesar of the main aqueduct that joined the island of Pharos to Alexandria proper. However, a much more serious phenomenon was occurring, unnoticeably. The Alexandrian coast was slipping beneath the waters of the Mediterranean. Even today, on a calm day, one can still make out the lines of sunken buildings from the ancient city. 21st of July, 365. Alexandria is devastated by an earthquake and then swept by a tsunami, causing tens of thousands of casualties. This disaster marks the beginning of the subsidence of Alexandria. La subsidence, c'est l'enfoncement des terres sous le niveau marin. À la suite de ce tsunami, donc, la côte alexandrine s'est progressivement enfoncée sous les eaux de la Méditerranée. Une des premières conséquences de cet enfoncement des terres a été la salinisation des puits qui se trouvaient en bordure de côte. 
Ce phénomène était particulièrement marqué en période d'étiage du Nil, puisque la nappe était moyennement alimentée à cette période-là. Donc le mélange des eaux salées remontant de la mer et le mélange de l'eau douce contenue dans la nappe phréatique fabriquait une eau saumâtre qui était dorénavant l'eau que les Alexandrins tiraient dans les puits. Pour résoudre ce problème qui se présentait à eux, les Alexandrins ont décidé de construire les premières grandes citernes d'Alexandrie, les citernes de l'époque byzantine. The brackish water rose into the wells. Districts close to the seashore were the first affected. The large cisterns constructed at this period were thus situated on a line parallel to the coast. The 9th century saw the appearance of the first cisterns built on more than one level. All sorts of elements from the ancient city were reused. Shafts of granite columns, marble ionic bases, finely carved capitals. In 1996, the Center for Alexandrian Studies began a project to relocate the old cisterns. One of these, El Nebi Cistern, is in the process of being restored. After 24 centuries of existence, the ancient channels would disappear at the beginning of the 20th century. A municipal decree of 1911 ordered the filling of the cisterns and wells in order to prevent the numerous illnesses that are spread this way. Through these remains, the very history of water in Alexandria bubbles to the surface.